Better we read it every day. Good yeah. afternoon and welcome. My name is Maxim Schreier. I am a professor at Boston College and I direct the seminar for Russian and Eurasian Jewry here at the Davis Center. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this uh, afternoon's presentation by our distinguished guest, Professor David Wolf, whom I will introduce momentarily. <clears throat> Let me just uh, mention a couple of things about our programs this year and also about our sponsors. So, of course, our main sponsor is uh, this place, Davis Center. And uh, I specifically want to thank Laura Sargent, who is here, really, who does incredible work behind all the events that uh, you can see and hear. We also have sponsorship from the Center for Jewish Studies here at Harvard, which we really appreciate. Uh, so this is our second event this fall. We had uh, a wonderful lecture a month ago that I think some of you attended by Claudia Smola from uh, Dresden, who spoke about her new book about the reinvention of the Russian Jewish literary tradition. And uh, also, I know that in February, on February 7th, we will have uh, Larissa Rimenik, who is uh, a sociologist from bar -Lan University from Israel, who will be speaking about Israel's uh, Russophone community, ex-Soviet community, and its uh, generational dynamics. Uh, and uh, we're working on some other exciting events for the spring. And uh, so now, without further ado, let me just say how delighted I am to welcome David Wolf, who comes to us from Japan. But before that, he comes to us from many places, some of them featured in the seminar and the various identities that it represents. So let me just say that he holds a BA from Harvard and a PhD from Berkeley. He is Director Emeritus of the Cold War International History Project at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and also a former Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow. In 2006, he was appointed Professor of Eurasian History at the Slavic Eurasian Center at Hokkaido University. If uh, you haven't heard of it, it's a premier center for research in these fields, Japan's National Research Center for the Post-Soviet Space. He's been a senior scholar at Harvard and a visiting professor at Berkeley and the University of Chicago. He's the author of many publications. Uh, the book whose title I absolutely adore, To the Harbin Station, The Liberal Alternative in Russian Manchuria, 1898-1914. David, you don't know this, but uh, I've been a great fan of this book, but also of the title, because the title is in conversation with the famous American book to the Finland Station by Edmund Wilson uh, and uh, uh, Vladimir Nabokov, uh, who has something to do uh, with the halls of this university and uh, uh, who was uh, a great friend and then, uh, antagonist of Edmund Wilson, has a lot of problems with this book, but I think he liked the lilt of the title to the Finland Station. This is to the Carbon Station. And also, he has co-edited, he being Professor Wolf, several seminal Trans-Pacific collections, and they include Rediscovering Russia in Asia, World War Zero, the Russo-Japanese War in Global Perspective. Uh, and I think one of your collaborators was uh, David Shimopanik, yeah, who was the late, uh, David, the late David Shimopanik, who was uh, a friend and a uh, uh, Classmate from graduate school. Oh, yeah, we once sorry. drove from New Haven to Cornell and mm -hmm. got to know each other very well. Yes, and uh, also most recently, Sugihara Chiuni and the Soviet Union, new documents, new perspectives. And I'm now <coughs> happy owner of this beautiful book, for which I thank David. And uh, today he will share the results of some of this research and he will speak to us about Siguhara Chiuni and the Soviet Union, new documents, new perspectives. Welcome, David. Welcome, Professor Wolf. Um, thank you very much, Maxime, for that very kind introduction. Um, very nice to see uh, some familiar faces and uh, some new faces as well. And um, um, it's a real pleasure always to be back here at Harvard. 
Um, so today I'd like to present a, uh, well, it's not a brand new, brand new book. It's almost a year old. Um, Sugihara Chiyune in the Soviet Union, New Documents, New Perspectives. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have, are familiar with the name Sugihara Chiyune. I'm seeing some nods, but some some non-nods, so I'll, I'll go back and I'll give you the, the brief overview. <laughs> right, some half nods. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Late in the afternoon, there could be lots of nods going on. <laughs> right. So in July, August 1940, Sugihara Chiyune issued more than 2,000 visas, Japanese transit visas, that made it possible for close to 4,000 Jews mostly from Poland, who had run across the border to Lithuania when the Nazis invaded Poland in um, September 1939, um, to cross Siberia to Vladivostok and take ship to Tsuruga and Kobe in Japan, where most of them survived the war and ended up all over the world. Um, 95% of the Jews who remain in Lithuania are, are slaughtered during the Holocaust, so with great likelihood, he does save their lives. Um, 30 years later, um, the survivors um, who lived all over the place hunted him down to thank him. They had a little trouble finding him, but they found him. He had he sort of changed his name. Um, and 20 years after that, he was inducted into Yad Vatim as a righteous among the Gentiles for saving Jewish lives, the only Japanese citizen to ever be a righteous among the Gentiles. Um, Sugihara was a complicated man. He was not only a diplomat serving as the acting council consul in Kaunas, um, but he was also a spy. Um, he was appointed the acting council in Kaunas, the interwar capital of Lithuania. Um, Kaunas was a city that had never had a Japanese diplomatic representative. There were no Japanese people whatsoever living there. Um, he was there specifically to look across the border into Poland and see what was going on there as the Soviets and the Germans divided the country. The Japanese ambassador in Berlin was very close with Hitler and the top Nazi brass, and they had promised him that the Molotov-Rippentrop pact was not for real, that there would be an attack on the Russians, but they wouldn't say when. And it mattered to the Japanese because it was important in terms of their timing if they were going to march south and begin the war against um, colonialism in Asia, as they would say, but that implied a war with the United States as well. So they wanted to know the timing, and they thought by having eyes on the ground, they would have a chance of seeing what was going to happen next. And it's Sugihara who gets the call. Um, does he fulfill his mission? Yes, he absolutely fulfills his mission. Um, there's three telegrams that came out in a wonderful collection of uh, um, published, written, published by the late Leonid Reshin. Is that right, Mark? Reshin. He was Leonid, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, 1941. Um, we would never have these documents except that somehow or other they, the, the NKVD got them. They were being sent to Tokyo to tell Tokyo when the war was going to start. We never found them in the archive in Tokyo, but we found them in the archive in Moscow. So somehow or other, Sugihara's warnings, which were right on target in terms of timing, he's writing in very late May into early June. He's counting how many tanks are moving to the border, how many troops are coming into East Prussia, how many lines of telephone wire are being laid across along every single highway, how all the children are being evacuated from the area. It all smells okay. like war, right? So he's he's right on target. He fulfills his mission and uh, he, he gets a, a decoration for doing so. On the other hand, that's not what he's famous for. What he's famous for is that while he's counsel, um, he, 
he's approached about providing visas to the Jews who were trapped in Lithuania. And they're not even thinking about the Nazis invading yet, although the Nazis are right there. They're thinking that they're about to be gobbled up by the Soviet Union after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, and that will be bad for them too. That's also a trap. So they want out. Um, and it's not Sugihara who comes up with the plan. It's um, a Dutch honorary consul named Jan Svartendijk, who has a couple of Dutch Jews on his hands who he has to get out. The Netherlands are occupied already by the Nazis. He can't send them back to the Netherlands. Um, they want to get out and go to the Dutch East Indies. The only way to do that is to send them down to Trans-Siberia. There's no other way out anymore. And he decides to issue them visas, but the word gets out. And there's thousands of Jews, estimates of around five to 7,000 Jews in, Lith in Lithuania at this time, refugees. The word gets out and he's immediately besieged by people asking if he will do the same thing for them that he's doing for these two such citizens, which is to write on any piece of paper that they have, whether it's a Polish passport or a safe conduct paper or anything, a note with the stamp from the Dutch consulate, he's got the stamp, um, that says, no visa is required to enter the Dutch colony of Curaçao in the Dutch West Indies. So these are the ABC islands. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. Beautiful tourist destination, Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao. So Curaçao is the larger of the three. Um, and uh, it also has the oldest synagogue in the Western Hemisphere. Beautiful synagogue, the sand floors, so you don't make noise. Great spot. Uh, so in any case, Svatendijk comes up with this idea. He immediately has hundreds of Jews at his doorstep. In the end, he produces, we don't know how many, 1,500 to 2,000 of these things, that pieces of paper that say no visa is required to enter. And this becomes their end visa. This is where they're going. Nobody expects them to get there, but this is where they're going. The next question is, how do you get there? And the answer is, where can you take ship from to go to Curacao? And the closest place you can do it that they can get to is Japan. And lo and behold, there's a Japanese consular official who also has stamps. So the next thing we know is Sugihara has a mob of Jews outside. I, I believe there was a picture on the website of people at the gate, at the, the gate surrounding the Japanese consulate. And um, after a little bit of hesitation, he agrees to provide the visas. And um, all the consulates are being closed. The Soviet Union invades. Lithuania is being closed down. It's no longer an independent country. All the con No need for consulates, no need for embassies. All of them have got to leave. They're all told to leave. Sugihara needs time to do the visas. Unlike any other consulate, he's given an extra month to leave. Why is he given an extra month? What does he do during that month? He produces 2,139 visas. And he also gets an extra month to watch what's going on in Poland, which is what his job is. Right. Who could possibly give him an extra month. The answer is he goes over and visits the Soviet um, Polpren, plenipotentiary who had been sent to Vilnius to take over. And that man is a man named Vladimir Dekanozov, who before serving as the Polpren, the plenipotentiary in Vilnius, um, was serving as the deputy foreign minister 
under Molotov. And before he was serving as the deputy foreign minister under Molotov, he served as the deputy um, to Beria at the NKVD. So this, this, is, this is a known killer. This is a security guy who sent over to the foreign ministry to improve security at the foreign ministry and then is sent to gobble up Lithuania. And when once he's finished with that, goes and becomes the ambassador in Berlin. Right up until the war begins. And because he's a Beria henchman, he eventually goes back to the Soviet Union. And when they arrest and shoot Beria, they shoot him, too. He's just too close to Beria. So Sugihara goes to visit Dekanozov, who's a real player. And Dekanozov is someone who can say, yeah, you can have another month. So Dekanozov is also the figure who must have been the one who says, right, we can do this. We, we, you can go across the Soviet Union to get to Japan. But we don't know much about that. Or we didn't know much about that because although the Sugihara story has been out for quite some time and it had been researched um, primarily in a fine book by Hillel Levine, looking at the Japanese archives, there's a fair amount of work that's done in, in Japanese as well. There's a scholar who worked, um, who was an archivist in the Japanese Foreign Ministry archive and unfortunately retired recently named Shiraishi Masaake. This was his specialty. He dug things out of the archive um, and found interesting bits and pieces about Sugihara. But wh why and how the Jews were able to cross the Soviet Union was a bit of a black box. We didn't know too much about it. Um, and about 10 years ago at a conference in Paris at a cocktail party, um, the head of the Holocaust uh, Research Center, a man named Ilya Altman, who some of you are familiar with, um, came up to me and said, have you ever heard of Sugihara Chiyune? Well, it was just cocktail talk. And it was uh, the beginning of a project. And um, um, thanks to his unparalleled connect connections in the Soviet Union, sorry, in Russia, um, we were able to dig materials out of um, five different former Soviet archives, plus the archive of the Lithuanian um, NKVD, the Lithuanian KGB archives, and published them in this volume. The volume has 91 documents in it. It's a um, 200 and 50 pages long. It has 160 pages of primary materials, 91 documents, 60 of which are out of Soviet, former Soviet archives, um, about 20 of them from Japanese archives, the ones that mate well with the Soviet documents to reveal something, and then a, a few others from various other sources that mixed in well. And uh, I have a couple extra copies if anybody's excited. And, uh, they're, they're available. Um, it's also available on the website of my home institution, the Slavic Eurasian Research Center in Sapporo, Japan. If you go online, uh, it's it's lighter, but it's not as beautiful. There we go. Right. So um, my major thanks goes to Ilya Altman, who unfortunately can't be here due to the war in Ukraine. He should be here. Um, he was really the driving force behind this. And um, he was the one who lined up the archivists. He, he was really impressive. And on the Japanese side, our collaborator was the number one specialist on Russian Jewry in Japan, uh, Professor Takao Chisiko, who also should be here, except um, that she's not in very good health at the moment. Right. So um, today what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of the findings that come out of the book. So pretty much introducing individual documents and what they tell us about Sugihara Chiyune that we didn't know before. And hopefully this will stimulate some questions. Um, so first of all, Sugihara Chiyune, aside from being a diplomat and a spy, is also the number one top Russianist of his generation. Um, he... He originally comes from Gifu province, which is near Nagoya, 
in Japan. And uh, he he wants to, his father wants him to be a doctor. Um, he, father makes him sit for the exam. He hands in a blank sheet and gets a zero and doesn't get into medical school. His father disowns him and he uh, applies and gets into Waseda University, an excellent university in Tokyo, but he doesn't have any money. And he, he gets in and he only has enough money because his mother gives him some money on the side for one semester, but during that semester, he enters the English faculty and studies English like mad. And on that basis takes the foreign service exam in order to become a foreign service language student. Um, and he takes the exam, he passes it. He wants to be a specialist in German, I believe, but they tell him they have too many for German already. How about Russian? And he says, yes. And uh, the next thing you know, it's 1919, he's 19 years old. Uh, he's born on January 1st, 1900. He's a true child of the 20th century. Um, he's 19 years old and he's shipped off to Harbin in China, where there's a large Russian population. It's the place where Japanese were sent to learn Russian. There's a special school, the Harbin Gakuin, um, the Harbin Academy, for training Russianists. In the course of 25 years, it trains 1,400 Japanese Russianists. And he's in the first graduating class when he graduates in 1923. And he's great. And the first document in the book um, is his uh, the speech that he has to give, not to finish the school, but to the foreign service officers who come over to test him to see whether or not he's going to get a foreign service post in. And he comes in and he gives a speech. Everyone else who comes in, I read the whole bucket of all the speeches that are given that day. Um, they all give about a four to five minute speech that they've clearly memorized. And it's short because that's about how much they can memorize. Whereas he just comes in with some notes and gives an extemporaneous speech. He speaks for 18 minutes. Um, he speaks about the, the development of Asia, um, it's a um, may, maybe nationalist rather than ultra nationalist, but it's a, a strongly nationalist speech about how the day of Asia is coming and how we must put down the Anglo Saxons. It's exactly the kind of thinking that was very much appropriate for speaking to foreign service officers in Japan in those days. Right. So he's right in tune with his times. Um, wouldn't call it particularly enlightened, but uh, but it sure showed that he was an excellent Russianist. Um, he was evaluated as highly promising and was assigned to the consulate in Harbin. And um, a week before he takes up his new job as the consul in as um, not as a consul, as an interpreter in, in the consulate, um, he marries a Russian woman. Um, um, and uh, converts to Russian Orthodoxy and from now on goes under the name Sergei Pavlich. Right, so he goes native. Uh, he's in Harbin for 15 years. He's living with his Russian family. He doesn't have children, but he has lots of relatives and he's working at the consulate. Um, he rises through the ranks as Japan takes over Manchuria he rises to the point of becoming a deputy vice minister in the foreign ministry of Manchukuo in charge of all of the Russians in Manchuria. So a more or less brilliant career in the cause of Japanese imperialism in Manchukuo. Um, it appears that he doesn't get, get on very well with the military authorities who are increasingly in control. Um, he's involved in some pretty rough stuff because the, the, um, the Japanese are trying to force the Russians who own the key railroad in Manchuria out, the Soviets. And he's, he's only the interpreter, but he's part of the negotiating team that continues to drive down the price of the railroad. The Soviets have said they're willing to sell. Stalin wants a lot of money. Stalin's 
tracking this very closely. We, we see it in his correspondence with Kaganovich, who is the head of the um, Ministry of Communication in these years. So he's in charge of the railroads. So his correspondence with Kaganovich, which has been published, shows their discussion of the negotiations for the sale of the, the strategic railroad. Sugihara is the face of the negotiating team because he's the one who speaks Russian. So he's the one who's always driving the price down. They don't even remember the names of everyone else on the team, but Sugihara they know. And each and so Stalin's correspondence with Kaganovich has Sugihara Sugihara in it. You go look in the index in the Kaganovich Sugihara Sugihara, right? Um, Sugihara has the honor of appearing on the front page of Pravda on 5 September 1934 in a report from Khabarovsk about the um, brazenness of the Japanese imperialists in Manchuria. This is in a time when Stalin is editing the front page of Pravda every day. He's looking at it, so he's not going to forget the name Sugihara. <laughs> um, in 1935, Sugihara resigns his position as deputy vice minister and returns to Tokyo to rejoin the Japanese foreign ministry and receives an appointment um, to go to uh, Kamchatka to negotiate a fishing agreement, very important fishing agreement. Um, he also, within the first months of returning to Japan, divorces his wife in Harbin and marries a Japanese woman more appropriate for the career he has in mind. In her memoirs, she says she asked him why he wants to marry her. And he said, you're appropriate for going abroad with me. <laughs> right. Very romantic. Yeah, very romantic. <laughs> right. Um, he, comes, he successfully negotiates the fishery agreement. He comes back to Tokyo, and he's assigned to the Mos to the Moscow embassy. So it's the prize. He, you know, he's going to the great center. He's the number one Russianist of his generation, and he's on his way to Moscow. And the Soviet Union refuses to grant him a visa. This all begins. His story about granting visas starts with him being denied a visa. The Japanese protest. They protest in Tokyo. It's taken up by the ambassador in uh, in Moscow. There's several rounds. We have the materials both in Russian and in Japanese. They pretty much match. The Japanese say there will be retaliation. The Russians say, we don't know why you're giving us such a hard time. He's a known anti-Soviet person. Why should we ever give such a person a visa? And they can't be reconsidered because it's already been decided at the highest levels. What would that be? That, that's only Stalin. There's no other highest levels. Right. So in any case, Stalin remembers Sugihara. Sugihara gets, doesn't get a visa. Instead, they send him to, to Helsinki. In Helsinki, he starts to run a team of uh, Soviet agents people coming in and out of the Soviet Union. He's good at it. Um, and when we get to 1939 and the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, um, he's reassigned to Kaunas, and we get to the beginning of our story. So he arrives in Kaunas on uh, 28 August 1939, um, and uh, he begins his process. He's actually a go-between between between the Polish embassy in London and Polish military intelligence still operating in occupied Poland. These funds are coming through him that are going into Poland, and information is coming out. That's coming first to him and then going on to London. But that's not really our story here. Our story here is about the visas and his issuing of the visas. Um, and 
they all they talk about how Sugihara had decided, you know, the, the Dutch visas came to him and he had to decide to give the transit visas. He goes to visit Dekanozov, and Dekanozov says, yes, if they have Japanese transit visas, they can exit the Soviet Union. They don't need a visa for the Soviet Union because they're in the Soviet Union now. The Lithuania has been annexed. All right. But what Sugihara doesn't know is that he's knocking at an open door. Because now we have a document, document 28 in this book, which shows that on 21 April 1940, so... This is three months before Sugihara is going to begin issuing these visas. Dekanozov has written, when he's still back in Moscow as vice minister of foreign affairs, has written a memo to Molotov, the minister of foreign affairs, saying there are three to 5,000 Jews stuck in Lithuania. And we have an offer for Inturis to transport them through Odessa, it's still possible to think of Odessa at that point. Um, and we're going to make a million gold rubles if we do it. Interest is all but dead after the molotov ribbentrop Pact. This will keep them alive by doing transit. And Molotov writes back on the document. We have his notation on it saying, um, consult with... Kaganovich on the railroads and consult with Dukolskoy, who's in charge of the um Morskoy flot of the um of the um Morskoy flot, um the um, um domestic shipping of shipping, the shipping agency, and um confirm that they can handle this. So essentially Molotov has given him a go-ahead to do this already. The Soviet side has already decided that they're they're ready to try to to um, to transport Jews across the Soviet Union in exchange for valuta, right, for gold. And they've been assured that the money is available through um, Jewish organizations that will put up the money. And, there are, and Dekanozov is saying that the people who are going to be transported are largely religious Jews um, from various yeshivas, in Poland, and indeed that's true for X percent of the people there. Not everyone, but X percent. And therefore, these are people we don't want to have in the Soviet Union anyway. We're going to get rid of people we don't want to have in the Soviet Union. We're going to make valuta. We're going to support Inturist. <clears throat> Mikayan also says yes, he's in charge of Inturist. <clears throat> um, so there's basic consensus that this is something that can go forward before Sugihara appears on the scene. Okay, so um, Dekanozov is moved to Lithuania. Sugihara comes on the scene. Um, Kurosau, um becomes the destination of choice. And um, when Sugihara goes to um, Dekanozov. Dekanozov says, "Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask okay. permission for this to happen." And we have the document, July twenty fifth, nineteen forty. Um, Sugihara of uh, Dek Dekanozov sending a cable together with the uh, Soviet consul in uh, Lithuania. There's still a consul there um, to the Politburo asking for permission to transport 800 Jews across the Soviet Union. Nothing about Vladivostok, nothing about Japan, nothing about Sugihara. 800 Jews across the Soviet Union, um, then they have visas and they have money. It's all going to be taken care of. It goes to the Politburo. Um, on uh, July 28th, and a decision is issued on July 29th, approved. They're to be transported across the Soviet Union in parties of 50 Jews per batch. Um, 
On at the back of this book is the list of all of the Jews who get visas from Suki Har and the dates on which he provides the visas. So up until July 25th, Sugihara has provided 14 visas. And he's been there for almost a year. He's provided 14 visas in, in almost a year. And on July 25th, um, no, on July 26th, the next day, he provides another 14 visas. So he doubles the number of visas he's provided. The day on which Dekanozov sends his request to the Politburo. Remember, Dekanozov knows that Molotov approves, Mikhail approves, and Beria approves. Because anything that Dekanozov's going to do, Beria knows about also. So he's pretty sure that it's going to be approved at the Politburo. And he probably hinted that to Sugihara. Um, on the following day, the, uh, the 27th, um, Sugihara gives out 40 visas. 28th is a Sunday, and uh, the consulate's closed. He doesn't do any visas. On the 29th, the answer comes back that it's been approved, and probably it comes immediately to him because on the 29th, he issues over 100 visas. Because probably on the Sunday, they didn't issue any visas, but they figured out how they were going to do mass visas. How did they do it? Well, the first couple of days, he was really he was exhausted because he had to sign everything. He had to write everything in by hand. But over the weekend, they got stamps made for every single part of the visa, including his signature. So now he could set up an assembly line of people who were just going to stamp these onto all of the visas. And they get going. And they produce 2,139 visas in the next month. Um, shortly after they get going, early August, Sugihara writes to his ministry and he says, um, I've got a couple of Jews, very rich industrialists who have come out of Poland and they'd like to stop over in Japan. I'm, I'm willing to provide them with transit visas. They have destination visas to the United States. They have lots of money. They're very interested in investing in Japan. Would it be possible to provide such people with transit visas? The ministry says, well, yeah, yeah, I, I guess we could do that. Right. OK. And we'll, we'll, when they get here, we'll see how long we'll give them visas. And then a, a few days later, he writes and he says, well, I've got some people here, some Jews from Poland, but um, they're they're traveling on expired Czech passports. They don't have Polish passports. They have Czech passports. So they're, they're Czechs who somehow were in Poland. Um, would it be OK for me to stamp them with transit visas? And the ministry says, well, yeah, you could do that. But it's really important that everyone have a, an endpoint visa before you put anything in. And they must have enough funds for their travel or else you should not give them any visas. Okay. So the ministry is basically not making it. He's kind of probing. And mean, meanwhile, we know that every day there's another hundred visas for people who are just Polish refugees, Jewish Polish refugees. So he gets in over his head. He, the ministry is essentially saying, no, you shouldn't be doing this. And he just goes for it. Um, and this is it. This is the humanitarian act. He's basically disobeying his minister. Um, I don't know if he really feels that it's his minister. This is a new minister who just came into office in July. So just a, a, just a, like just before he starts issuing, the first day in office of Matsuoka Yosuke is July 22nd, 1940. And the first, the, the request for, to, for Stalin to approve the transit is July 25th. 
So Sugihara may have kind of made assumptions based on what he thought the previous minister would do, but this minister turns out to be tough and he's not going to say yes. Yeah. But there's nothing to be done. It's, you know, it's launched. He, he signs the visas. Um, they, they all travel out. Um, and, 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 and Sugihara himself gets an extra month to spy on what's going on in Poland and then has to close the consulate and leaves for Berlin, where he's reassigned to Prague. And then he's sent back from Prague to Königsberg to open up a consulate that's never existed before and see what the German troops are doing in East Prussia, from where he will eventually send his reports about the upcoming invasion. Um, but when he leaves, the stamps and the templates for visas remain behind. He doesn't take them with him. He leaves his stamps behind. And they fall into the wrong hands or the right hands, depending how you see it. And even after Sugihara leaves Lithuania, visas continue to be produced. He leaves in the early days of September He's reported as arriving in Berlin on September 6th. And the NKVD investigation about the case called Fabrikanti, the makers of visas, um, false visas, begins in November. The NKVD works slowly and thoroughly working up this case and moves in in March of 1941 and arrests 94 um, people, 81 of whom are Jews, who were involved in a ring for making these false visas. And at the time that they arrest them, they also arrest 492 complete visas. But we don't know how many visas were produced between September and March. Um, so he issues 2,000 visas. And in this volume, we have the interi statistics for 1940, 40. It's always been a big question. How many people actually traveled on the Sugihara visas? Hillel Levine in his book estimates, estimates, guesstimates, as many as 10,000. Sugihara's wife in her book, which is called The 6,000 Life-Saving Visas, says 6,000, which some people think of as an echo for the 6 million, but maybe she knew what she was talking about. Um, on the other hand, you would think that Intoris would have a pretty good count on how many tickets they sold, at least for 1940. So the 1940 statistics are pretty clear, pretty accurate, great detail, because um, they don't actually start the main transit until December of 1940. All these visas, the first batch is issued, you know, the Sugihara, real Sugihara visas are all issued by September. And those who have enough funds, they're on their way right away. But those who don't have enough funds, they have to kind of wait for the funds to come through from London and from New York. And, and they also have to wait till the Soviet side in East sets up a kind of a convoy system for them. There's a hotel that's being renovated in Moscow the Nova Moskovskaya. There's a hotel that's being renovated in Vladivostok so that they can have pretty thorough throughput. It's not going to be 800, as was told to Stalin. It's going to be a lot more. And Interist knows. Because on December 14th, Interist provides, uh, writes up a document. This is their Predvaritoni plan, their original plan. Uh, document number 55 in this book, in which they say there's going to be 2,500 people. And we're going to send 500 a month. Um, we're going to put them on, there's um, 10 trains a month on the Trans-Siberian, two to three per week. And we're going to put them on uh, the 10 trains. There's going to be 50 on each train. There's three boats per month from Vladivostok to Japan. There'll be 150 to 160 on each boat. So they, they figured out their plan um, and, um, and they start moving all of these people who are going to be on charity funds, who are going to be traveling third class, which is 
uh, what do you call it? Joske mista. Yeah. Those of you who know about Joske mista, a hard, hard seat, as they call it. Yeah. Right. So that's a long, tough trip. That's a 10 day trip down the Trans Siberian and hard seat, but it's life or death. So, you know, better to use your visa. Um, right. Um, so that process begins. And um, and um, we just don't know how many of the, the fake visas there were. There may have been more fake visas than there were original visas. Um, but the entities numbers are pretty clear. Um, there are 421 Jews who make it to Moscow between um, December 19th and December 31st, 1940. But, and uh, those people continue on. But by the end of 1940, already 1,230 transitniki, transit passengers, have exit, who have come from Lithuania, have exited from Vladivostok. So we have a number, 1,230 for 1940. 1941 is a little bit messier because, of course, by the end of 1941, no one in the Soviet Union is worrying so much about exact statistics for transit across Siberia. They're involved in their own life and death struggle by then. So the best numbers that we have are some numbers from June, which should be good enough, which give statistics at the half year mark. But they're not broken down quite as cleanly. And um, you have to do some pluses and minuses and subtractions. But the best I can figure is the maximum number it can be is 4,200. And the minimum number it can be is somewhere over 3,000. So somewhere in that ballpark, that's that's the real Sugihara total. And um, I, I think the Intori statistics are, are pretty effective, at least for bracketing the number, even if we can't get it down to a final number. No one's ever gone through and been able to say which of the people on the original Sugihara list actually used their visas. We know some of the people, but we only have testimony from 20 or 30 of the survivors who were the ones who were most vocal, the ones who hunted down Sugihara, the ones who lived the longest until Sugihara became a hero. Right. So that's one of the mysteries that has been somewhat solved by this new research to kind of bracket off the number of people involved. Um, there's Sugihara, of course, lives on in memory as well as as a flesh and blood person who actually performed these deeds. And in the course of the 19th 80s is inducted into Yad Vashem and much more recently even became much more of a public figure. So Prime Minister Abe, the late Prime Minister Abe of Japan, um, went and gave speeches at Yad Vashem invoking Sugihara. He went and gave speeches at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial invoking Sugihara. He went to Sugihara House in Kaunas, which is the old consulate building, the old consular building where Sugihara um, signed the visa, stamped the visas, um, and talked about the great humanitarian indeed, because indeed um, this has become a figure suggesting that Japan during World War II did not do only evil, and therefore he has taken on important symbolic value for Japan in the realm of memory, a kind of a counterbalance to um, the rape of Nanking, Unit 731, um, the comfort women, it's, he's kind of a balancing point. And an, an, excellent, an excellent article showing the way in which Sugihara was made into a hero um, came out it's a little bit cynical for my taste, but it's an excellent article in um, the American Historical Review in 2023, uh, written by uh, my friend Rotem Counter at the University of Haifa. 
Um, but nonetheless, whether or not Sugihara has been mobilized for um, by, by, by what uh, Counter, Professor Counter refers to as memory agents, um, whether or not you can say that's true, um, nonetheless, the deed itself, he does it against the, uh, the orders of his ministry and does indeed save all those people. And of course, leaving the stamps behind, that's, a, that's an extreme violation of, of consular discipline and probably meant to save them, to divert it happen in just the way it did. Um, there's a few spots, disappointments in this research, things, <clears throat> answers that I couldn't provide. So Sugihara lives in, um, in Harbin for 15 years. There's a large Jewish population in Harbin in those years. There's some terrible moments for that population. Um, um, there's a, a Russian fascist party that's formed in Harbin. There's hoodlums associated with the Japanese military mission who um, perform, who basically start kidnapping rich Jews and, um, and blackmailing them in order to get funds. Um, Sugihara is in charge of the Russian population at Harbi during those years. He must know all about it. We don't know anything about it. He never writes anything about that. He never says anything about that. It's as if he didn't know anything about Jews until Kalnus 1940, but that just can't be. And uh, we don't have any information about that. So that's still one black hole. Um, the second one is that Sugihara, who's on Stalin's blacklist, um, Sugihara, who can't be given a visa to Moscow, um, Sugihara, whose name is left out of all of the correspondence about the transit. It's always about uh, visas were given in Kaunas. Sometimes it's mentioned visas were given by the Japanese consul, but his name never shows up in any of it, as if people are trying to keep his name out of it, because it might be recognized as that Sugihara from Harbin. That Sugihara from Harbin in 1960, when relations are reopened after the war between Japan and the Soviet Union, is granted a visa to come as a business representative to Moscow and works successfully for the chemistry industry, Japanese chemical companies building chemistry, chemical factories in Russia. He's very successful. He lives in Moscow for 15 years, retires comfortably to Kamakura on money well earned. Uh, how do you go from being uh, an enemy of the Soviet Union to being uh, in the good graces. You couldn't make a profit doing that if you weren't in the good graces. I mean, all foreigners went through KGB files. So we don't have an answer to that. And we were unable to get the KGB file released. So that's something we still don't have here. Um, we know there is a KGB file. Um, in 1945, when the war ends, um, Sugihara is serving in the Japanese embassy in Bucharest, and um, he's interned. He's not returned to Japan until 1947, so he's interned for almost two years in Russia. Um, and uh, his, his files normally should be in the military archive, and when we went looking in the military archive, we found his wife's file. We found his three children's file. We found all the other members of the So it must have gone somewhere. So when we haven't been able to find where it went, probably was united with his KGB file. Um, but we haven't been able to get our hands on that. Um, when Sugihara comes back to the Soviet Union in 1960, he changes the reading of his first name, and he becomes not Sugihara Chiyune, but Sugihara Senpo. The characters can be read differently. So when his name is written out, his name no longer matches his old name. And he stops calling himself Sugihara. He starts calling himself Sugivara. So he changes one letter in his last name as well, in the hope that, well, we don't know why, but he did it. 
you know, but he no longer matches the pre-war Sugihara. If you were searching by name in files and you didn't know what the characters looked like in Japanese. So that's Sugihara the spy, still a little bit of a man of mystery, um, does indeed save roughly 4,000 Jews um, and uh, now continues to have a second life in memory as um, an agent of the Japanese, Lithuanian, and Israeli government. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, David. Uh, this was truly fascinating, and uh, we'll open up for questions. I just wanted to say what I particularly appreciated is uh, your resistance to heroics, because I think stories like that uh, have a tendency to overdo the heroics at the expense of complex and mixed motivations that some of the people, uh, um, the, another close parallel, probably the closest parallel is uh, Aristides uh, de um, Souza Mendes, uh, who was doing very much the same thing at the very same time, who was a Portuguese consul in Bordeaux, who actually issued more visas against the direct uh, prohibition of Sazar's government. And again, the question of the motivation is uh, very important. And I think uh, it tends to be in everything I know and understand more complex than the kind of expectations of heroics. And I wonder if we could start off by you're talking a little bit more about how you understand the motivations. And of course, being in Bordeaux in 1940, one, I think, knows a little bit more about what's going on than being in the Kovna in Kaunas in 1940. Uh, but and also, I think, being a European, hmm. educated in France, you know, having a sense of what uh, is in stock for European Jewry, it's a little different from being a Japanese diplomat. Uh, so. Kind of, how do you understand these motivations? Uh, going beyond the question that they were mixed, clearly. Um, I think, I think you know, I'm willing to take him at his word that largely this was a humanitarian effort. He, he's, he's probably the person in Kaunas who knows the most about what's going on in Poland at this very moment. He's spying on Poland. He knows all about what's going on with the Jews in Poland. You know, it's not like we're we've reached the final solution yet, but absolute brutality towards the Jews of Poland as the, as the Nazis invade, you know, massacres, you know, the beginning of the ghettoization. So he, he's, he's heard all about that. And therefore, you know, he, 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 he understands that there's risk here. And he's also someone who's absolutely expecting war between the Soviet Union and the Germans. You know, the Jews themselves, they have no reason to expect that. They don't know that the Nazis are going to come across the border. But Sugihara has every reason to assume that, that the Nazi war machine is going to take Lithuania in no time. And those Jews are going to have the exact same fate as the ones in, who are still in Poland. So... I'm willing to take him largely at his at, at his word on that. He says afterwards, what would you have done? There they were, you know, women and children and old people. And the only thing that stood between them and, and getting out was me. Because the Dutch consul had already put it on the line. And Dekanozov said, we can do it. And, that, you know, you could say, well, that's a kind of peer pressure. And maybe it is a kind of peer pressure. So, you know, you could call that a motivation, right? Um, there may be something from his Harbin background as well, but that's that, that's the blank spot about which we, all, we don't have too much. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but this period is told in one important fiction by uh, Julius Margolin, who many of you know as the author of The Journey to the Land of Zakah, he also wrote a short uh, novel called Yvreska Epovis, The Jewish mm -hmm. Tale, where specifically there is a description of Kovna, of going via Moscow on an interest uh, transport oh. and getting out. And he wrote it in the 50s. And uh, uh, and the second thing is in a way of testimony, and then we'll open mm -hmm. this oh, up. Oh, I want to copy that. I knew, 
uh, еврейское поезд. Еврейский поезд. I knew Victor Ehrlich quite well because I was a graduate student in New Haven. I had lunch with him many, many times, and I probed him about his family's escape. Mm -hmm. uh, for some reason, I cannot explain. He was very tight-lipped about it. Mm -hmm. And back then, I wasn't even working on uh, Holocaust history. Uh, I, was, I was a second-year grad student, but I knew that they got out under these circumstances. Right. But somehow he did not elaborate. He would just say, we got out uh, from Kovna, then we came to America eventually, and then he enlisted in 1943. Uh, so in any case. Right. Uh, so you, you ask about the motivation, but do you mean only Sugihara's motivation? Because remember, there's multiple actors here, and they all have different motivations. Probably these documents should speak more to the Soviet motivation in granting the visas. Um, you know, I spoke about the money. The money is certainly real enough. Um, the more money is deposited in the end than they spend, more people could have been saved. Um, in Turist, in the end, all you know, Dekanosov was promising 1.5 million gold rubles. They only make about 800,000 gold rubles. It's paid in 11 different currencies. It comes from all over Europe and the U.S., um, so, you know, very transnational story, if you will. Um, there's also been, you know, you know, so there's three, I, I should also mention that in addition to the documentation, there's three introductory essays in here, one from each of the editors. And in uh, Ilya Altman's essay, he discusses the possibility that Dekanozov as as someone who prior to taking on responsibilities as a diplomat, you know, call it a diplomat, right? Um, um, call it a proconsul, right? Um, before that, he's in charge of, um, um, what do you call it? Um, external spying. Um, so, and it's possible that they were thinking about recruiting people on the train. There were warnings about that in the diplomatic correspondence. Um, the American ambassador in Tokyo writes that he has heard that some of the Jews are were approached by the NKVD to become agents. Um, on the other hand, we've never had any case come out, you know, either someone coming out and saying, I was recruited. Um, nor after 91, did anybody write a memoir and say, oh, we did that? You know, and so, you know, maybe that they, they tried, but certainly nothing ever came of it. So, you know, that might have been a motivation on the Soviet side as well. Well, why don't we take some questions, uh, starting with Mark in the back. Um, Hi, Mark. <laughs> first of all, thanks a lot, David. Very interesting talk. Um, the, uh, when you left the stamps behind, I'm, I'm wondering who was is, who is actually using them? at that point. And also, did he have, is there any indication he was concerned that someone would just confiscate him and basically put an end to the whole process? Well, that indeed is what happens. The, in the end, the NKVD day rolls up the network, um, but they take a long time doing it because they want to follow all the leads and catch everybody. But in the meantime, every everyone who's got one goes. And who's, who's actually using it? Well, when the arrests are made, um, you know, there's, there's a full set of documentation about that. We have 10 of the documents in here, but there is a wider file to choose from in the Lithuanian KGB archives. We were just lucky that it was Lithuania. So, you know, that's the best collection of KGB. Well, Ukrainian KGB probably also impressive, but Lithuanian KGB, right. Um, so in Kavide for those years. Um, so when they when they make the arrests, they arrest 94 people of whom 81 are Jews. So it must be mainly a Jewish ring providing visas for Jews. Mainly, but maybe not all. When Sugihara is at, when he gets to Prague, it, there's kind of a, there's a dicey moment. You know, his, his ministry doesn't know that all of these Jews are coming because he hasn't told them the numbers. But when they start to arrive in mass, it, it doesn't pile up until like early February. 
But, you know, <laughs> they're coming at like 30 a day, 30 a day, 30 a day. And when they get to February, there's starting to be a lot of Jews in Vladivostok and they're starting to show up in mass at Suruga. And, and the minister finally writes to him and he says, how many visas did you actually issue? And, and we have the document, it's right on the cover in which he responds and says, oh, I, I sent 2,132 visas, and of which 1,500 are for Jews. And we don't quite understand that. We think that it was a lot more than that. Is there some reason why he's trying to play down the number of Jews? We think that it's 95% Jews. Um, but for some reason, he's playing it down. So one of the other motivations for Sugihara, and we think this is probably the case, um, is that, remember, he's running this network of Poles. He's running, we don't know, a couple of dozen people in and out of Poland who are bringing him information, but now the Soviet Union is taking over Lithuania. It's no longer safe for those people to be coming in and out of Poland. You know, it was, no, it was not safe in Poland, but now it's not safe in Lithuania either. They're not gonna be able, there's no safe place for them. They have to be gotten out. His closest collaborators, he gives them Japanese passports and takes them with him to Berlin. And they stick with him, you know. The, you know they're they're on the books as being like a waiter at the at the consulate, or you know some kind of, or you know the janitor at the. But he takes them with him to Berlin, his closest collaborators. But he's still got a whole team, and they're probably mixed in with the four thousand. So this is their way of getting out as well. And the, the Polish ambassador to Japan, who's still at his post, even though Poland has disappeared, he's there. His, his memoirs say that those people came through. But again, we've never been able to identify anyone by name. So we haven't been able to really corroborate that. So that may be an additional motivation as well. Very interesting. More questions, please. Uh, thanks for a fascinating uh, presentation. I work on... Uh, Jewish history in Brazil, and the main editor of the main Jewish newspaper in Rio de Janeiro for basically much of the Cold War was um, someone who had a Sugihara visa named David Marcus. Mm -hmm. He was originally from Poland, and he gave a really fascinating testimony, which is about three or four hours to the Spielberg archive, and he talks a little bit about his journey, and he was on the same train as the Mir Yeshiva, Mm -hmm. And so it's part of his description. Um, and so I'm curious also to see if he's if he's in your list in the book. Oh, I'm sure he is. Yeah. But uh, but it, 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 I, I would I'm happy to give you a copy of the, copy. Of, of the list. To, that you, sorry, no, I'd, I'd love a copy. And I have to apologize. I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes. Please take a copy on the way out. Um, yeah. If you skim down the list, you'll find him. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you will. He says he was a Sugihara visa holder. You know. There, there's these different images of Sugihara, you know, the, the survivors themselves, they all say he was a saint, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it just means they don't know how to read Japanese faces, you know, <laughs> he had a friendly, yeah. smiley face, he, he was someone who totally knew how to just be ingratiating, and once he decided, you know, I'm sure he agonized a little bit about whether to do it or not, but once he decided to do it, he would just put the best face on it. And he was just nice to everybody. And he, you know, patted kids on the head and, you know, just totally nice to everybody. So he probably just looked like an angel. They might not have been able to read. But of course, these were desperate people who, you know, refugees. They were sleeping in one pair of clothes. They were sleeping in doorways. And someone is saying, there's a way out. Go that way. So no surprise. Right. Sure. So, yeah. So I would expect there to be. Couple of, no. Yes, sir. Right. Sorry. Of course, it would be a great project for someone to really gather together all the different testimony and mm -hmm. to do the experience of, lead, of of the actual receiving of the visas, of the train trip. Of, of the, No one's really done it. There's bits and pieces all over, but I haven't seen any. Well, that's what I was there. kind of alluding to yeah. because I was know, the very on surprised. The ground, the on the ground picture. And it sounds like there's enough, enough of them out there to 
at yeah. least do a good paper out of it. Well, he spent the war in Shanghai actually after after he got his visa. About a thousand. So about a thousand. You know, there's four thousand of them who get to Japan. Those who have relatives anywhere. Those who have money somewhere. They all get out wherever they can. The Japanese want them out. Um, but about a thousand have no place to go, and money is coming from um, from. Sorry, what's what's the Jewish organization that would, from the joint? Money is coming from the joint to the Kobe community to support those Jews. But after Pearl Harbor, no more money can come from anywhere to Japan. So there's no more money to support them. It's a small community. They can't support a thousand refugees. So they end up going to Shanghai and staying in the Shanghai ghetto. Cool. Uh, so let's go back to Josh. Josh. So a couple of quick questions. First, is it possible that when Dekanozov left the job of being Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, he was replaced by Solomon Lazovsky? Has anyone made that connection? Lazovsky becomes deputy head of the Southern Fund Bureau as well and supervises the anti fascist committees, including the Jewish anti fascist committee. Mm -hmm. He's later executed in August 52. Mm -hmm. So there's just that transition from Dekanozov to Lazovsky. So I'm pretty sure. Uh, are you really sure that he re that Lazovsky takes office right as Dekanozov leaves? Know, that's what right. I'm asking. So I'm pretty sure Lazovsky is already there. And he's, there's a, more he's than a one deputy. Oh yeah, there are several deputies. Okay. There's a, Rishinsky is also a deputy already at this okay, point. Good. And I want to say that the, all three of them are deputies at that moment. Okay. Right. Dekanozov, Rishinsky, and Lazovsky. Um, I think there's one more who's in charge of protocol, but I forget his name. But you know, in terms in terms of substance, those three are the main one. So I think Lazovsky is already there, and of course he's Jewish, and maybe that plays a role. We have no reason to think that Beria was particularly hard on Jews, as far as I can tell. Or you could tell me otherwise if you think so. In fact, there are several points where he's very good to Jews. Right, well, he's the one who's always slipping notes to Molot the Molotov. You know, Polina is still alive. I don't want to say very good, but... Right. right. Uh, and there, there's also kind of a rumor out there, but I haven't been able to prove it, that Dekanozov's mother is Jewish. Um, so only Polish Jews could avail themselves of this opportunity. So all the thousands of Lithuanian Jews could not seek a visa in this way. So we do have Lithuanians on the list, people who get visas, who are listed as Lithuanians, who are traveling on Lithuanian documents. And in principle, they're not allowed to leave because they're already Soviet citizens, right? The vote's already been taken. Um, and some of them are not allowed to leave, but we think some of them do manage. Technically, they are not Soviet citizens until August 6, 1945, if I'm not mistaken. So August there is 6, 1940. Right. Yeah, right. At four, 1940. Right. August 6, so 1940. in other words, there is a brief period when they, they are right. kind of not fully Soviet citizens, although they are already kind of occupied. Am I right? Right, you are, but not, but they're but only the ones who took their visa and immediately left. Yeah. Who had enough money to just get on the train and go right now. Those people would have gone before August 6th. Right. They could have if they got the first batch of visas you know, on July 25th or July 29th, they might have been out. In time. But almost everyone yeah. who's on this list doesn't go until December. And at that point, Lithuanians are. But we also have stories about people who are picked off, people who the, the NKVD day picks them up and they don't get to travel further. There's a story, you know, the ones who go to Moscow, it takes a couple of days until they're able to get on the train because you have to wait for the next train. There's only two to three trains per week. That So they're in the Novomoskovskaya for a couple of days and Intorist is offering them tours of Moscow, right? You know, that's what Intorist does. OK, and there's one story about a woman who insists she wants to go see the Kremlin and she goes off on the tour and she doesn't come back. And her family the next day has to get on the train without her. Yeah, you can imagine that. So shall we take a couple of more questions? Of course. Of course. Did you have more? Yes. I just, may, I just had one more quick thing. And that's it. Sugihara was so effective as a spy and he was of Japanese background. 
that makes it all the more likely the Russians must have had plenty of spies who knew whatever he was learning, they were learning. So, so it just reinforces how much Stalin was ignoring. Well, you know, they might, you know, my personal reading here is that Dekanozov slips it by Stalin. But it's not just Dekanozov. All three of them, Molotov, Mikoyan, and Beria know better. And they, they've they all seen the documentation that says there's three to 5,000. When, when, they, when, they, when Dekanozov <laughs> writes to Kaganovich, and says, do we have the trains to do this? He writes to him and he says, we're expecting 5,000, right? And and then he writes to Stalin and says, there's going to be 800. My quick point was not about the fate of these refugees, but about the Germans' intentions. Mm-hmm. The Sugihar as a spy was able to understand what the Germans' intentions were. Stalin was getting that information from so many directions. Of course, that just reinforces that. Right, exactly. Th- those documents, Sugi Sugihara's reports on the upcoming invasion, we find them in the Moscow archives. They they go they go right to Moscow. Right. Okay, now we'll take your question, sir. Yeah, I've been studying the Holocaust since I was about five years old because of family background, and um, I know this story from, from my childhood. But a couple of quick questions. Um, Sugihara san is the only Japanese recognized by Yad Vashem. Yes. But many people think his wife was very much involved in this too, and she also should be recognized and was very active in this. And then uh, the second question you know, I've heard stories of people that survived the Holocaust um, first hand, second hand, third hand. How difficult was it for you know, Jews in the Ukraine, Jews in Poland that somehow sneaked into the Soviet Union? And uh, some even entered the, the, the Red Army, on my understanding. How difficult was it for, for Jews to, to sneak in? Didn't a lot of people sneak in, maybe thousands? Sneak into where? The Soviet Union, and uh, away from the Nazis. So once the war starts, um, you know, the lines on the map move, yeah. and people end up you know, on all sides of things. There's a lot of migrations. There's a lot of deportations. There's a, a lot of desperate escapes. You you know, run for it. Yeah. Right. right? And so I, I think that at the level of thousands, that was happening. I don't think it can happen at levels much higher than that. I myself had a relative who was in the Bukovina and made it into the Red Army and, yeah. and then spent the rest of the war trying not to end up in Stalingrad. <laughs> you know, he was fine being in the Red Army, he just did not end up. I don't think that's what you're describing, though, if I understand. I think you're referring to tens of thousands of Jews who were Polish citizens who were able to get into the Soviet-occupied Poland and then into the Soviet hinterlands and survived in both, both, both. ways. Because that's a well, but that's kind of a very different story. Yeah. But I, I've heard stories from the Ukraine. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's the so-called paradox of the survival of Polish Jews. They survived because they were in the Soviet hinterlands. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of those people are deported to the Soviet hinterlands. There's a huge deportation that Stalin conducts right before the war. And they're sent to Siberia. And if they survive that, that's right. They probably did better than staying in Poland. So shall we take one more question? Yes, please. Okay. I read about 10 years ago a book that was written by German and French historians addressed to students in the first grades in France and Germany. And uh, Sugiwara was mentioned in that book, and it was sponsored by the European Union. And if I remember well, they were saying also that it happened because there was no Jewish problem in Japan, that anti-Semitism does not exist in Asia compared to the Christian world. Is that something that you touched on in your uh, research? Um, so... I would say that Jews don't really exist so much in the consciousness of the average Japanese person. Um, We'll see what happens if the Gaza operation goes on for much longer. That could raise consciousness considerably. Um, 
if we go back to the, the early 20th century, you have a pretty high percentage of Christians in Japan. It's gotten much lower since then, but back then there was a pretty high percentage and they knew about Jews from the Bible. And there were people who knew a fair amount from reading the Merchant of Venice. So there, there, there is a, some level of anti-Semitism, but there's a level of anti-Semitism that's, you know, there's the two sides of anti-Semitism. There, there's the Jews, the Jews who are bad and evil and killed Christ. Right. And then there's the powerful Jewish consortia that controls the world. Um, they're both admirable and dangerous at the same time. And both of those are anti-Semitism. And um, I would say that probably in more recent years, we see a little bit more of the latter form in Japan, a kind of an exaggerated sense of the influence of Jews in the world. Um, among those who know that there is such a thing. So the Sugihara, Sugihara, he has two lives. I haven't emphasized this enough, really. Um, one is his real life and what he did. And the second one is his life in memory and as a symbol and the way he's deployed in history books as a representation. Um, um, I didn't want to spend too much time on the representational part. That's a whole separate kettle of fish. Um, and this, this research was more about trying to dig up contemporary documents to understand a little bit more about who he really was and what he really did and how that transit across the Soviet Union came to pass. Great. Well, I think this is a great note to conclude this seminar to thank Professor Wolf again for this presentation. Thank you all for coming.